Yeah, I just have a few slides on rotation types. Yesterday we had a little group that was going to discuss some of this stuff for Shepherd's Range. So I went over to Target and found a, a bag of granola that had gluten free, so it didn't have any wheat in it. It had all these crops that I thought you could grow here in, or a number of them in, in that bag. It tasted pretty good, didn't it? Yeah. And then, you know, and it was. It had millet, it had quinoa, it had amaranth. Well, quinoa is really just lamb's quarter. Um, and we know you can grow that. And amaranth is just pigweed, we know you can grow that. Um, it didn't have flax, but you can grow that. John talked about corn, and he's doing corn, and everybody says it's too cold to do corn, but the Native Americans did corn at La Pa, Manitoba. Anybody had the pleasure to go to La Pa, Manitoba? It's six hours north of Winnipeg. And they're, in the breeding programs, one of the base programs in the early breeding programs, the thing they called Hudson Bay Flint, which is a variety that comes from a tribe on the shores of Hudson Bay. So there's some really early maturity out there, and I can't imagine we couldn't take some of these early flint corns and grow them here and grind them up and make them into cornmeal and have some producer that just be more than willing to sell it either as cornmeal or as <coughs> corn chips into the into the granola market over in on the west coast. So there's there's a lot of things. When we started at Dakota Lakes, you couldn't do anything but Wheat and summer fell, and everybody knew that. There was a <clears throat> ag conference. They had a banker and they had a farmer, a rancher, and me and whatever. And I got up, so well, I'm the new guy here. And I think, I think if we know till we grow corn here in this big cattle market where we ship 5,000 head of cattle a week into Nebraska and Kansas to eat, <laughs> to eat corn that's grown under irrigation on an aquifer that's grown dry using fossil fuels to pump it, we have an advantage if we can grow the corn and feed the cattle here. And then the other three guys in the panel spent the next hour and a half telling everybody how stupid it was. So, uh, so when we talk about diversity, that's really our answer. We want diversity in seeding dates and rooting patterns and root architecture and residue types. And that gives us diversity in the insect pests and also in the predators, the good guys, the friendlies we call them. And, and this weed suppression, people tell you know, the canola grapeseed guy talked about today, that's something that you can get. And you also suppress the nematodes, those poor fessy grapeseed type things, or the Gensia canolas will whack nematodes out of the system. One of diversity of microorganisms and harvest dates, so I get better use of my combines and these beneficials and more, okay? One goal is to be inconsistent in both sequence and interval. John said he was at the national no-till, and one thing they probably talked about is rootworm resistance. Right? Spent a lot of time on that. Corn rootworm, what it does is it, the mother, uh, or the, the adults will feed on the silks of the corn plant, uh, <clears throat> then they will drop to the ground lay their eggs at the base of that corn plant the next year after a diapause, the next spring that baby will hatch and he eats corn roots. Well, if you rotate, you don't have them, at least initially. So everybody got to doing corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. They were consistent in terms of interval every other year. They were also consistent in sequence every other year. So they developed in the western corn belt an extended diapause corn rootworm beetle where the eggs don't hatch for two years. <laughs> okay? And I had a graduate student who, or an undergraduate student that worked for me, and then he, <clears throat> he went to work for Monsanto after he got his master's degree. And I said, well, Dale, you got to try to get those guys to diversify over the corn belt because he went to DeKalb, Illinois. He said, you think we'll get extended diapause corn rootworm beetles over there? And I said, no, you're going to get females that fly from corn fields to soybean fields to lay their eggs. And he just leaves.
couple years later, I get a telephone call. He said, how in the hell did you know? <laughs> I said, how did I know what? He said, how did you know that? He said, I'm sitting there watching these females fly across, these gravid females, fly across the road from the cornfield to the soybean field to lay their eggs. I said, Dale, it's a joke. I didn't know that was going to happen, but that's another way of getting resistance, right? So I just thought I'd joke with him, you know, know that I'm going to get diapause or going to get this other thing. So you've got to be smarter than an insect or a weed or whatever. Simple rotations, wheat, corn, fallow, wheat, corn, canola, wheat, this, these, are consistent in sequence and interval, corn, soybean. They look pretty good until Mother Nature has a chance. If we get all wheat, corn, pea, for instance, we could get rootworm beetles that lay their eggs in winter wheat fields. If we all did that in an area, or if I did that on all my farm. It's simple, because we just have a simple number of crops to manage the market. That's one of the things you like about it. It's, it's <clears throat> not simple because we have all corn behind wheat or all winter wheat behind spring wheat. The other problem we have where we live is if you plant all your corn in wheat stuff when you have a wet spring and it's cold, you have a hell of a time getting all your corn in because it's too cold and wet. Now, it's a good problem if to dry you, okay? Uh, <clears throat> rotation with perennial sequences. This is what Grandpa used to do. He would put in a perennial every so often and he would do several things with that perennial. This could be a grass. My dad did this, my grandfather did this, your grandfathers did this. One of the things is that perennial would put a root system really deep and pull that line back up to the surface. Right now you have these saline seeps. What's in your saline seep? Calcium carbonate or lime. And he's spreading lime, but you've got the lime that's down there if you don't let it go to the bottom of the hill. So if every so often you put in a deep rooted crop, it sucks this stuff up and drops it back at the top. And the other thing is, it's like hitting the reset button. So you can do, in terms of diseases and insects and weeds and stuff, you just kind of hit the reset button. So you can do stupid things for a little while, and then before Mother Nature catches on, you go away. Now, I got corn, soybean there, whatever. We'll talk later about you can make lots of different crops. This could be millet, this could be calf, this could be sorghum, okay? Soybeans could be peas, could be lentils, could be any kind of thing, or it could be your brassicas and those kind of crops. We're still simple, and in fact, we've got a limited number of annual crops to manage the market. It's an excellent place to spread your manures on these perennials, because you've got good root structure there to run a heavy turf and stuff around without packing the heck up. But probably can produce more soil structure than annual crops. And I'm, I'm starting to believe that, and you'll see that tomorrow, that I think we've got to have these in order to get the true soil health that we really need, soil structure. I don't think we can do it only with, with annuals. And <clears throat> biomass crops where we do something like switchgrass to, to grow biomass for either maybe export to Japan here doing something like Timothy or for um, for dairy feed or for whatever, you can grow a perennial. A lot of our switchgrass and big blue stem now go into dairies. And they mix that with distiller's grain and just use that for the, for the carbohydrate. Uh, <clears throat> the trouble is, if you have 40% of your land in alfalfa, you'll never get it all harvested in time. So this is the kind of thing you do close to your farm maybe if you had a feedlot or a dairy and then you're more further out fields you probably do the biomass uh, instead of the feed stuff. Combination of two more simple rotation gives the compound rotation so we do spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. The one I talked about where corn followed wheat is sometimes too wet. Well half my corn follows soybean, half my corn follows wheat. And I call this kind of rotation a mother-in-law rotation, or a banker rotation. Because if your mother-in-law happens to be a banker, you're worse than a nightmare, right? <laughs> Think about that. If she comes to visit you in June, <clears throat> if you plant your corn into wheat stubble, it looks like hell in June. Okay? But it looked really good behind soybean. 
So you take her to show her this cornfield. If she comes to visit you in September, you show her this cornfield. Okay? But what it does is it spreads the rest of wet and dry ears. And one of the things is this corn will fail on us now and then when we get a really dry year. But it's my cheapest corn to grow. It's also my highest risk corn to grow. Actually, a third of the corn we grow dry right land now goes behind some kind of a low residue crop, so it really takes off. And if you get a sort of dry year, it's, it's crap. If you get a good year, it's really cheap to grow. Liver number crops demand these more than one sequence for some of the crops, more than one interval for something like corn rootworm, so you confuse them. Uh, you still only have three crops. Okay? Uh, now, if I do complex rotation, instead of the spring wheat, I may have barley, instead of winter wheat, uh, sorry, barley and winter wheat, I got corn, sunflower, sorghum, and soybeans. Right? Could be teff here, could be millet, this could be a pea, could be garbanzos. And what you do is you just take this whole suite of crops that fit those definitions and you start putting them in. And we were talking about it yesterday about. How do you test this? You know about wheat and spring wheat and those kinds of things. What you do is start looking at these alternative crops and just put some strips out there with the different alternative crops and figure out which ones hunt for you. Okay? Uh, we can get a wide array of crop time type and sequence combinations here. It requires a lot of management marketing skill. Okay? But <clears throat> that's why you're the manager. It used to be you were, you were a good manager because you could drive the tractor straight. Now we got auto steer. We don't need that anymore. So now, now when you're out there, instead of driving the damn tractor, you'd be thinking about how I'm going to market and get on your cell phone. You do all this stuff that you, you used to be going like this. And I've never good at that anyway. Nice thing about those hills, John, they can't tell if you drove crooked or not, right? <laughs> you get to a nice flat field. You, you drive along and say, gee, that guy drove crooked. You know, and do can't tell. You could be doing a crappy job and they never know. <laughs> Stacked rotations. And I probably got more fame out of this thing here than anything else. It's because people like like the work. You know, farm boy, oh, I, I do some stacking, you know, and whatever. So we, we <clears throat> but what we do there is we do we we corn corn soybean soybean, for instance. We stack these rotations, and the reason we do that, there's a couple of reasons, but uh, it mimics, in essence, what Mother Nature does. If you had a piece of disturbed ground, you'll see one kind of weed come in, and it'll be there for a little while, maybe two or three or four years, and then all of a sudden something else comes in, and then something else. It's like a succession thing, and that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, <clears throat> now. The goal is about long time for pest pressure to climb. The, the real secret is the long, the long breaks. It's not how often you're in, it's how often you're out. So you knock the weeds way down. I'll show you a bunch of this tomorrow. You knock the weeds way down. And then before they figure it out, you come in and go boom, boom. And before the diseases and stuff figure it out, you're gone. If you think about wheat diseases, for instance, the, the, the residue, uh, not the bruts that come in from the south, but the residue uh, uh, type wheat diseases, tan spot septoria and those kind of things, right? If you think about them, by the time you get to here, there's none of them left, right? So your disease triangle is, got to have the, the inoculum, the weather, and the host. Right here you have no inoculum, so 50% of your wheat's going to have no disease. Whereas if you're doing the rotations you guys are doing, every time it rains, you've got disease because there's always an oculum there. You're always one year from being out of, out of wheat, okay? Uh, so the, the secret is the, the big break. And then the second year wheat, you only get disease if you have a wet year this year and then you have a wet year this year. Well, the probability of having two wet years in a row is pretty damn low. <laughs> Okay, so that's the idea behind, behind the thing. Goals allow long breaks, then you sequence, keep the pest population diverse or confused because the sequence and the intervals are all screwed up. 
And the other thing you can do is you can use a mix of long and short residual oversight programs. So your chance of developing resistance to these post-emerge short residual herbicide programs you're using all the time is pretty low because you're just come out to the first one can be a long residual like we can use atrazine on the first year corn and then you don't use atrazine in the second year corn by the time two years are gone you have to worry about atrazine carryover. See that's that's an example of that. Um, we, we, we're not worried about biotype resistance of any kind and, and, and our cost of herbicide programs go down. So. Uh, and then you've got these ones where we got all kinds of different things going on. Spring of memory, peak corn, millet, sunblock. But all of those, see, we still got to mix it. We've got the, the stack of the warm season grasses, we've got a legume, we've got a oil seed, and the two weeds. Okay? Uh, no set recipe. Individual fields may need different treatments. Depends on your landlord and your ownership and how close it is to the building and the history. Uh, I had a young guy come one time and, and he, he kept asking me what kind of rotation he should use. He kept trying to tell me where he lived, whatever. And I saw he had a, a, a wedding ring on. And most guys, you look around, most farmers don't wear them because you get, you get caught in something, right? And he still wore it. So I know he said, Oh, I see you just got married. <laughs> and he goes, Yeah, just last week, you know, or two weeks ago, and got back from running even last week. And I said, So who picked your wife? <laughs> He said, I did. I said, well, then you got to pick your own damn rotation. <laughs> right? So this is a little South American drill we're playing with. Uh, we're making an air seeder out of it. The thing I wanted to show you is how, how much ground can control. Uh, it can follow the ground contours really well. But anyway, that... <clears throat> So the crops, we think of them in crop types. You can back up here now, John. Uh, we think of them in crop types. So you have your warm season grasses and your cool season grasses. And that's a very distinct difference, right? There's C3 grasses and C4. How many people know C3 and C4? Okay, good. A lot of people don't. <laughs> C4 is a different pathway, photosynthetic pathway, and, and the layman's way of thinking about it is, is a C4 pathway, so warm season grasses, and big blue, that's a, and if a real biochemist was here, he'd just now grab me and take me outside and whip me. But that's kind of what happens, so if you put a wheat plant in a corn plant, or a millet plant in a wheat plant, wheat being C3 and millet or corn being C4 in a closed container and, and let them grow for a while, the wheat plant would die for lack of carbon dioxide and the corn plant would continue to go. Just be perfectly happy. They're incredibly efficient at taking carbon and that makes them also incredibly water efficient. And that's why some of this stuff, now when you start feeding carbon up <clears throat> to a corn plant, like John is doing, then it does things. And after you get long-term no-till, these guys at Gettysburg, they go all visited at one time. Another. We had a relative, we had a really dry year in 2012, we had a relatively dry year this year. The guys at Gettysburg this year harvested between 180 and 200 bushel dry land corn. Central South Dakota, where they used to do a 100 weeks summer film. It's the damnest thing we've ever seen. We do not understand exactly what's happening. But I think it has to do with mycorrhizae. You've heard Jill talk about mycorrhizae. And I think it has to do partially with mycorrhizae because we now have this ability to explore the soil for more water than we ever did before. And we also have these earthworm channels. So the thing drops its roots down there and it hooks up with the mycorrhizae and I think we just do a way better job of pulling water out of the soil. A lot of the guys in the corn belt would be happy to have yields like these guys in Pittsburgh are getting. And, and, and they're not because they have unhealthy root system. They're going to go into some of that tomorrow. And, and Jim Cook told you all that, so did Roger Fisa. So I'm going to tell you again tomorrow the same thing. But they, you've got this really healthy root system and it's very good at taking in water and it's very good at taking in nutrients. And, and you, I don't think 
Randy Anderson stuff at Akron, really dry area, Akron, Colorado, just east of Denver. And my stuff, and guys from Dickinson, North Dakota, which is a dry area. You can't really optimize a no-till system without having warm season grass in there somewhere. And the numbers he said with his wheat coming behind, I wouldn't put wheat behind corn anywhere but in the Palouse because you'll get head scab. The thing that decomposes wheat, corn stalks, the same causes head scab and wheat. So if you had a rain during, if you had a rain during flowering, you could really get in trouble. So I wouldn't recommend you doing that. But having that in the rotation for us was worth about 14, at least 14 percent in terms of wheat yields. Just you have almost identical rotations, but have that warm season grass that's at least 14 percent. So. Questions? So you got warm season grass, cool season grass. The, the, the broad leaves don't break out that much. It's more of a spectrum. You got the oil seed, you got the legumes, but <clears throat> sunflower is kind of a warm season, but not as warm a season as cotton. <laughs> okay? So you got a little bit more of a spectrum there in terms of what you're looking at. Yeah, question? I've heard you speak several times about, about this. You have my apology. No, no. <laughs> I wasn't going to accuse you of a few things, but I'll let um, Sourcing, sourcing materials has, has, been, has been a problem for you. Uh, you talked about split corn. I, I tried corn uh, when John was, was first starting corn. I was involved in the no-till project and we were raising corn. Our problem was getting the normal corn to dry down. Even the short season, we find it to dry down and kind of use this as corn kernels for feed in the fall. Um, you talked about flint corn. How would, a, how would a person go about sourcing materials like that to try? Yeah, the flint corn would be really interesting, because there, but there are some organic people that do flint. You know, and, and that's a good question, because some of that stuff has somewhat disappeared. But, you know, one of the tricks with corn that I think, uh, the dry down thing, you can, you can actually take it on the ear pretty wet and lay it for X and it'll, it'll keep that way. And if you're feeding cattle, um, that's a pretty good way to do corn. And I don't know why we all started combining it as grain. And, well, I do know because we started shipping it off the farm. When I was a kid, we did everything was all your corn. And, and then, it, you know, for dairy, dairy rations or something, whole ear corn should this, this ground is wonderful because you got all that fiber in there. I mean, it's just really good stuff. Not as good for not as good for finishing pigs or finishing the last sixty days of steers or something like that. But but for grower rations and stuff. So and it'll it it'll dry that way. It's just you're handling a big volume of stuff. But yeah, I think some of the early stuff for the food market has a real alternative. I think millet. I'm not sure about calf. How many people know what calf is? Yeah, more people know what calf is than C4. But it's, gluten -free. it's a gluten-free Ethiopian grain. Very quick. It's used for used mostly out here for hay. And that's that might be alright too for grazing or swath grazing. I mean that's the other thing you can do is swath grazing and some of those things. The forage sort of sedans you do fine here for for forage, and I'll show some pictures of those, uh, the German millet type things will do fine for forages, for sloth grazing. I don't like to see you take all that stuff off and not bring the manure. Even if you take it off and, and, and try to bring the manure back, you don't bring the nitrogen back. So, I was really intrigued by that thing with the canola and stuff at noon. I was going, okay, we got another idea, you know, for doing that grazing and the winter canola thing and then going into the winter with that might be the way we could do winter canola. So I come to these meetings to learn, not to teach. Yes. Well, we mentioned Jim Cook, mm -hmm. and he just published his last article in September. Okay. I'm not sure you've had a conversation. I have no, I haven't seen it. Okay. <laughs> became suppressive. And it became the 
Transpot, Septoria, the insects, the nematodes, uh, the weeds. Well, I threw out the thing that Ray Archuleta is talking to him about the oldest species corn cropping. Mm -hmm. And he started quizzing me on every disease, soilborne disease, and only man who was in the Yeah, they get opinion about everything. It, it's not a, it's not always right. <laughs> so I'll warn you right now, but I have an opinion. Um, I am a bit more conservative with mixes than Ray, because he wasn't no killer until he met me. We, we converted Ray, and then we created a monster. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I love Ray, but. <clears throat> You know, it's a little bit like Joe Clapper and years ago, she was giving a talk and somebody's asking her about rotation. She said, well, if you did this rotation, you can get to, you know, this one has more mycorrhizae and then this one has. And finally, I was in the back of the room, I kind of went like this, and you see Jill go, uh oh, Dwayne's going to ask the question. And he said, how much do you sell your mycorrhizae for? See, and, and I am very careful with my mixes to try to avoid bridging diseases across to the next crop. And the argument on the other side of that is if you have enough diversity, that doesn't happen. So it's not a big part of that's what people say. But I go, I don't trust them. So if I'm going to go to, uh, to corn, I'll be very heavy on, on broadleaf type things in my cover crop. I may have a little oats in there, but I would never put millet or something in where I'm going to go to corn. Where I'm going to soybeans, for instance, I'll have rye and <clears throat> yeah, going to corn out of the brassicas, the legumes, and those kind of stuff. That's where Steve's stuff would come in, right? And I might have the oats in there, but it, <clears throat> but I wouldn't have the millets. When I was going to, if I'm going to go to to the soybeans, I'm not going to have anything that's going to take cis nematodes across. I'm not going to have anything that's going to take white mold across. I want my white mold to go away. So we're going to use the rye and those kind of guys coming back to the soybeans, rye and hay millets and all this kind of the more carbon I can get in there the better. And that's and that's my thought process. Well, you've answered it better than Dr. Cook. You tell us. Oh <laughs> that, that's a hell of a compliment by the way. Uh, you know it's really an interesting thing because <clears throat> for all the people that were aware of Jim Cook and the first time we did this meeting I followed Jim, and Jim went out in the, in the hallway because people were asking questions. I gave my talk, and I had a, a little question to answer afterward. And it always appeared that Jim and I disagreed about things, because Jim would be pushing this high disturbance seeding with fertilizer in the trench and those kind of things, right? And I'm low disturbance and, and whatever, okay? Jim's a pathologist. And, <clears throat> And then finally at a meeting in Colorado one time, I preceded Jim. And, and, and I did my thing, because he'd never really heard me. And then I didn't go out in the hallway, so I don't want to hear people say, well, I want to ask you questions, and we'll wait until we're done, I want to hear what he says. And he got up and he said, <clears throat> almost as good a quote as I can get, he said, if you do everything Dwayne says, you can go have coffee. You don't need to listen to my talk to me. But if you want to grow wheat more often than that. <laughs> so what Jim was telling you to do is what you were asking him. You were saying you weren't giving him the choice. How do I grow wheat? And I'm going to answer this better tomorrow at the end of my talk. Because I got quotes. Okay? Out of his book. But I, <clears throat> the thing you asked was how do I grow wheat two years out of three? or every year. You didn't ask me what's the best way to grow wheat. Best way to grow wheat is in these diverse rotations. If you want to grow wheat every year or every two years out of three, you can do it if you keep peeling off enough money for the technology. But Mother Nature is way better at this crap than we are. You know, I get, I get kind of a big kick out of, you know, our <clears throat> The, the techie guy, there we go, the answer we're going to do with technology, we're going to do with technology, and Mother Nature, you know, I mean, 
doing gene things and whatever. Mother Nature's going, you damn amateurs. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this for a couple million years. Try this one. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, God, what, what'd you come up with that? <laughs> you know? So I don't know. But there's a there's hundred ways to, to there's a hundred ways to do these things. And you guys are all really good at it. The thing I found about the guys in South Dakota, once they got started, they're really good at figuring out what's happening out there and, and oh, here's a crop I can use or here's something they can use and, and make money at it. But sourcing seed is a big issue. Getting labels for herbicide things is an issue. I mean, it really, some of this stuff takes some time. And thank God we still have an IR4 program. But, uh, because you have to get approvals for the labels to do a few things. But get seed, and then, for you guys, I think actually figuring out a place to go with the, the product isn't as big a trouble problem as us because we're out in the middle of the country. But, you know, things happen now is we're getting flax processors coming to the state, we're getting pea processors coming to the state, we've got sunflower pot processors, we've got all this economic activity that didn't happen. We had wheat cow, we had wheat cow, we had trains. And if you think about trains that take things out, your nutrients go with it. A unit train of soybeans, I haven't done it for wheat, but a unit train of soybeans is a million pounds of phosphorus. <laughs> we had a we had a tiny Taiwanese trade delegation there one day, and I do cover crops on my irrigated ground. I do cover crop before my winter wheat, and then they, <clears throat> and those cover crops die. Cow peas die when it gets below about forty degrees, and you know it's winter. They go, I gotta go back to Oklahoma for God's sake. I don't know what I'm doing here, and. <clears throat> But they're dying, and I'm explaining that how as they die, they fed nutrients to to the winter wheat. And the, and the one guy who was there with him that spoke English said, oh, that means you don't need to use fertilizer. And I said, well, yeah, I do if you're going to buy the wheat for me and take it to Taiwan and eat it. I need to replace those nutrients that you took away from me. Unless you're willing to load the poop from Taipei Tai 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 into a container and ship it back, <laughs> and this guy gets this really looking face, I'm going, okay, I just plucked the diplomatic tour part of this <laughs> this deal, and then finally he kind of thought about it and he said something in Chinese, and everybody started laughing and making shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> So, but in, in, in my presentation tomorrow, I have a thing that says I'm a farmer. I take sunlight, water, carbon dioxide, and make them into things I can sell. Very good. So, corn isn't all that great right now. You're paying 300 bucks a bag. Well, you get it cheaper than we do. Well, you can get, yeah, you can get some stuff. But they just, you know, it's really high. Yes, Russ? Have you utilized any livestock grazing on the research farm? Not my own. <laughs> my neighbor, my neighbor has furnished me some. But... Intentional or otherwise? It was kind of unintentional, but... Uh, we're getting very close to doing that right now. We're, we're, what we're going to do with livestock, which I think is the way we're going to have to do it, is we're going to have self-propelled grazing cells. And, and you should be able to call up your grazing cell on your, on your smartphone, turn on the webcam and look at how they're doing, monitor if they have enough water. We have technology with all this today. <clears throat> take a look at how much forage is left there, start it up and move it if it needs to be moved. You know, we, we, we've automated, we've done livestock in confinement, which is God off the way to do things. 
we've done livestock and combined because we could augment it. And, and then we haul all the feed to them and whatever. I've got these South Americans, Argentine guys that visit me and they come and they watch all these bailers in South Dakota run and they go, Oh, Duane, the cows in Dakota have no legs. <laughs> is doing a lot for us. We're, that's, he's, our, he's got 800 cows. The cronin has got 800 cows. And they do the Howard Buffett thing if you get the... Uh, who's, who's doing this? Cronin Farms. Dan Forty. He's it, the Howard Buffett Farm Journal thing if you get the right ones. There's a the thing that Howard Buffett is sponsoring and, and Steve's on that team. There's four of us are on this team and we've got three farmers and Dan Cronin Farms and Dan Forty are, are our guys. But they took, they took uh, hay millet type stuff this summer and they, they swapped it and as they were, after they harvested their spring uh, oats bales, they made bales, they set them off the side. Uh, then they put in hay millet and, and when they swathed the hay millet, they drilled between the hay millet sloths with winter triticale and those kind of things. So they'll have the fresh winter triticale to eat. <clears throat> they'll have the hay millet stuff and they move the oats bales back out into the field and then they'll move wires. And the, the Canadians all do this. Almost no cows in Canada go to buildings anymore in the wintertime. They stay in the field. And, and the, the Ag Canada at Brandon and Ag Canada at Lesbridge have done wonderful work on comparing how they handle the cows. And the best thing to do with cows is leave them in the field and figure some way to graze them. And one of the reasons the Canadians had developed that was BSE. Because their cows are worth nothing. An old cow is worth a dime a pound. If you live more than 10 miles from town, you're better off to shoot her than haul her to town. Think what that does to a cow-calf operation. So they had to figure out how to take a whole bunch of costs out, and they did, but they didn't cows out. So, you got another talk to go to. I'm sorry. It went on too long. Thanks a lot, Colleen.